So um, thank you all for coming to the event called What is Loving Justice? Embodying Transformative Change with Kai Cheng Tom. Um, I'm Julia Sinclair Palm, and I'm an assistant professor in childhood and youth studies uh, at Carleton University. And uh, I just want to remind everyone that this event is going to be recorded. Um, and I also want to start by acknowledging that Carleton is located on the traditional and unceded territory of the Algonquin uh, Anishinaabe people. Um, and I think land acknowledgements are a way to honor and respect the land we're on um, and the commitments we make to land um, and to Indigenous folks. Um, I also want to begin by thanking all of the departments who came together to make this event possible. Uh, it's like kind of kind of a really great uh, a thing that happened. So um, the Pauline Jewett Institute and the Women and Gender Studies Program, um, the Department of Law and Legal Studies, the Department of Sociology and Anthropology, and lastly, the Childhood and Youth Studies Program all um, helped to make this event possible. I also want to thank the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences um, and Emma Frazier and Laura Barrow for helping with all the technical support on this event and um, to Kit Chalkley for making the fantastic poster for this event. Um, so uh, I'll give you a little bit of a rundown about how the next hour is going to go. Um, first, I'm going to um, introduce our excellent speaker, Kai Cheng Tom, um, and uh, she'll give a talk on uh, what is loving justice. Um, and then after that talk, uh, Kai Cheng and I will have a bit of a conversation and then we'll open it up um, for the audience to kind of pose some questions and we'll have a Q&A. So if you come up with questions that you wanna ask, please, please post them in the chat thread um, and that's how we'll engage with them there. So feel free to post them at any point in the chat thread. Um, yeah, um, so uh, without further ado, I'll introduce Kai Sheng Tom, um, who is our speaker and I'm so excited. Um, uh, so Kai Sheng is a writer, performer, cultural worker, and speaker. Um, she's a Lambda Literary Finalist. Uh, I could go on about all of the awards and finalist things, uh, but um, <laughs> I just selected that one. Uh, and has been featured in Ting Vogue, CBC, The New York Times. Also, that list goes on forever. Um, and she's written four books, and I'm so excited. She has a new children's book out coming in the fall with Arsenal Press called um, For Laika, the Dog Who Learned the Names of Stars. So maybe we'll get to hear a little bit about that uh, in the, the conversation we have. Um, but uh, yeah, thank you so much for coming to speak. Um, you, you're, you're a little bit of a hero in my world. So it's really nice to have you here. Thank you so much. Yay. I'm really honored to have been invited by Professor Sinclair Palm. I just like calling people professor something if they're a professor, it feels like really like, dignified and special to me. Hopefully to see you do it as well. Um, and yeah, really delighted to be here with all of the rest of you too. Um, I'm speaking to you today from Toronto, also known as Toronto, both of which are indigenous names um, for uh, a city here on land traditionally governed by the dish with one spoon wampum. Um, the dish with one spoon indicates the nature with which the resources of the land are meant to be shared as I understand it. Um, the traudinal stewards of this land are the Haudenosaunee, the Huron-Wendat, uh, and the Anishinaabe, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. Um, although over the centuries, many indigenous peoples have come to call Toronto or to Toronto home, as well as settlers. And I'm just very grateful and humbled always uh, to be working and living um, on, on these lands and to be presenting nowadays, like usually through Zoom to like other places, uh, which feels kind of equally humbling and uh, important to acknowledge as well. So thank you everyone. Um, I'm gonna start with a story because I don't know, <laughs> I, I don't know, I, I find my own lectures quite boring. And so I will start with a story. Um, I'm a storyteller. So hopefully you're ready for a story. If you are, maybe just type into the chat, ready. I won't start until at least one person has typed ready in. <laughs> oh, wow, like fast. Oh, it's because it's Carly, okay. Oh, you're also ready. <laughs> Wow, fast. Okay, hello. So once upon a time, once upon a time, once upon a time, there was 
uh, a land that was a world that was governed by a sun god and a moon goddess. And the sun god was mighty and the sun and the moon goddess was cunning. These were their strengths, what they were known for. And they ruled all the lands with cunning and strength and order and discipline. But far across the sea, there was an ancient spirit who was born so powerful and so beautiful that those who followed her loved and feared her all at once. Uh, they called her love. The ancient, the ancient spirit, they named her love. And she was so mighty and so gentle all at once that the sun god and the moon goddess grew fearful that she would overtake them, that her power would outshine them and she alone would rule the skies. So the cunning moon goddess and the mighty sun god came up with a plan. It was a perfidious plan. Do you know what the word perfidious means? If you do, type it into the chat. Um, so the perfidious plan was this, the moon goddess, pretended to be the best friend of love, pretended to be love's best friend. Do you know what that might be like to be love's best friend? Hmm. The moon goddess spoke, chatted, laughed, <laughs> cuddled with love. The moon goddess pretended that she had all of love's best interests at heart. And so love admitted to the moon goddess that she was secretly in love herself with the mighty sun god, which the moon goddess, of course, had suspected all along. The moon goddess gave love a vial of her tears and said, if you drink these, the next time you meet the mighty sun god, then the two of you will know forever if your love is true. So love was very excited about this. She went to meet the sun god in her secret garden beneath the sea, and she drank the moon goddess's tears but they didn't do what the moon goddess had said. No, instead they put love into a deep, deep sleep from which she could not be woken. And while she lay there sleeping, the mighty sun god tore love apart, ripped her body to pieces, and then scattered those pieces all across the lands so that she might never be put together again. Perfidious, dear ones, that is the meaning of perfidious. But don't lose hope, lose not hope. Hope can still be had. You see, where the pieces of love's dismembered body fell, they were absorbed by the earth, absorbed by the soil and the grass and the other plants. And then those grasses and plants were consumed by animals. And some of those plants and animals were consumed by humans. And so the humans who consumed parts of love's body absorbed a part of love's spirit. And so they became her children, the children of the ancient one, were known by their unruly bodies, their unrelenting love, their rage and their sorrow and their happiness, their joy that could shake the heavens and knock down mountains that could call forth rain from the skies. Yes, dear ones, the children of love, they still live among us today. The children of love though were known to the followers of the sun god and moon goddess. And the sun god and the moon goddess, remember, they were cunning and they were strong. So they told their followers that the children of love were monstrous, were perversions, that their unruly bodies and their powerful emotions were perverse and corrupted, were poisonous, were dangerous to all around them. And so the children of love were hunted and haunted from sea to sea, driven from lands in the homes that they knew. Sometimes a child of love might be born to what seemed like uh, normal parents. And so sometimes these children of love would lose their homes and families too. Maybe this is a story that sounds familiar to some of you dear ones, maybe. So the children of love learned to hide and survive in many different ways. Some of the children of love uh, assimilated and became just like the followers of the sun god and moon goddess, holding their unruly bodies tight and closed, keeping their powerful emotions and magical spirits hidden deep within. That's a story for another time. Others became consumed by the rage and anger of love's broken body 
and they became hungry spirits wandering all the world looking for vengeance. That too is another story. Here's a story I will finish telling. Some of the children of love went and took, <laughs> went into the woods past the mountains, uphill and down dale. They crossed rivers and crossed oceans. And when they finally felt safe, they built a village together, a village of love. Can you imagine, dear ones, this village of love? It had a library full of books of love, poetry of love. It had a music hall full of songs of love. They built walls of love. They built houses of love. They built a whole shining, shimmering community of love. And in the center, they built a temple to love. The children of love grew and grew in prosperity and happiness. But remember, the dismembered body of love and all the echoes of her shattered bones and torn flesh still rippled and ached within the bodies of the children. And so the children of love found that even though they were safe from the children of the sun god and the moon goddess, they still had that pain inside them. And so that pain erupted from time to time in suspicion. They looked at each other through the eyes of suspicion, through the eyes of untrusting love, which had been betrayed once already, one time too many. And so they began to hear in each other's words disloyalty. They began to see in each other's bodies treachery. They began to hear in one another's words perfidy, perfidiousness, and they began to argue amongst one another. What was the right way to serve love? What was the right way to live out love's dream? What was the right way to run love's village and worship at love's temple? And as, there, as, as they began to argue more and more and more, their arguments became fights and their fights sometimes even turned into violence until one day a terrible mistake was made. A terrible mistake was made and somebody was really hurt. A child of love was hurt by another child of love. And so what did they do? They hurt each other more and more and more this conflict became deeper and deeper woven into the body of the village of the children of love. And soon they began to start fires. They burnt down the library of love. They burnt down the homes of love. They tore down the walls of love. They burnt down the temple of love in love's name. Does this sound at all familiar to you, dear ones? Does it sound familiar? So the village of love was lost somewhere past the mountains, uphill and down dale, past rivers and oceans. There is a village of love that is still waiting to be discovered, buried underground, scraps of poetry and pottery, pieces of smashed walls. Somewhere out there, there are still children of love. Maybe you know them. <laughs> people with unruly bodies oh, and a force of emotion that could shake the skies. Yes, dear ones. And our mission as children of love to reunite once again, to rebuild the village and the temple of love, to bring all the pieces of her dismembered body, her broken body back together, to be unified as one whole, singing in harmony. The question is, how do we do that? Well, that's where the lecture comes in. Uh, that's the story. Yay, we love stories. Let me talk a little bit about concrete stuff. So I have too many PowerPoints. Uh, okay, there's the right one. Um, also, I invite folks to take a little breath. <laughs> to slow down, even if I can't slow down, you can slow down. And if there are any thoughts or feelings that emerge immediately from that story, maybe they can appear in the chat and I'll catch them as I go. So, I'm coaching Tom. I already got introduced, which is so nice. I'm a writer. I'm also a professional conflict mediator and other like alternative dispute resolution practitioner. I was a social worker and family therapist for many years. Um, I'm also a somatic sex educator. I have like nine different jobs it's because I'm a, I'm a millennial, perhaps like some of you, and we live in like, you know, digital capitalism. So I have to have a lot of jobs, but I also really like most of my jobs. Um, okay, so let's see, anything happening in the chat? Not so far, perfect. So 
today we're going to talk a little bit about conflict. You can see <laughs> my slide, what is trauma? We'll talk about that in a second. Um, but first, I would like to invite you to do a little practical exercise with me, just a short meditation. We don't have a ton of time today, so this will be just a taste. Um, if you're willing, if you're not, that's okay. You can just skip this activity, you know, open another browser. It's a totally okay. Um, the invitation is to land in a place of stillness, either seated or standing or lying down, to find easy breathing, whatever that is for you, and feel into your body. If that's open, if not, maybe just focus on a neutral spot in the room. Yeah. And the invitation here is to think about um, that feeling you get when you look at a baby or the feeling you get when maybe you look at an elder. So when we look at a baby, we often, many of us feel like, oh, that person deserves their best chance. And even if we don't really like babies, most of us are, um, can still feel some kind of like, oh yeah, it's a baby. They deserve to be treated decently. Or if we look at an elder, many of us also feel like, ah, oh, that's an elder. They also deserve to be treated with respect or at least decently. Maybe that's a feeling we get when we look at any human being. I don't know, it's pretty individual. So the invitation is to turn that feeling on yourself. Like what if you could look at yourself and go, oh, just because I'm a human, I deserve to be treated with decency and respect because I deserve that. That can be pretty challenging for some of us. And if that is really challenging, just know you're not alone. That's okay, that's okay. This is just an invitation. You don't have to take this as like a forever uh, conclusion just to consider what's it like if I look at myself as though I were sacred, worthy of dignity and respect, capable of love and being loved. Hmm. And then breathing into that a little bit, I invite you to expand your view of yourself so that you're also looking at your deep-seated needs. Like what are the things you need as a human to live not without having to dive too deep because this is just a short meditation. What are those things you need in order to live? What about your values? Those things that are really important to you. Sensing into those without having to dive too deep. And then maybe expanding a little bit more to take a glimpse at your shadow. So these parts of you that maybe you don't like that much, these parts of you that maybe feel wounded, the coping strategies or survival mechanisms that you know, feel painful or cramped sometimes without having to dive too deep. Just noticing that they're there. Maybe noticing how mm, almost every single one of our survival mechanisms all of our wounds are in some way saying, I want to save your life. Hmm? What if we looked at it from that perspective? Again, just an invitation, a curious inquiry. What if my wounds and my woundedness were trying to save my life? Hmm. Does that change anything? Looking through that lens of sacredness, my wounds are sacred too. It doesn't mean I want them to stay around forever, that I want to live from them, but they're a part of me and sacred too. And then expanding once more, let's look as well at the mask or persona that you bring into the world. Like the part of you that you show to others, your professional face, your student face, your professor face, your teacher face, employee face, whatever it is, parent face maybe, sibling, child, these things that you bring into your mask, the persona you wear around others, noticing those roles, identities, categories. Maybe they constrict you and you're like, oh, I don't always like these. And maybe they really give you purpose and meaning. Maybe they're what makes it possible to interact with the world sometimes. Seeing if we can hold both of those at once, looking through our lens of sacredness, my mask is a part of me and that's sacred too. Even if I don't always like it, even if I want to change it or rip it off, maybe I will do that. 
Still, maybe that part is sacred. And then one last time, expanding your gaze, your, <laughs> your spiritual or uh, cognitive gaze to imagine your best self, like you when you're like really best, when your actions are aligned with your values, this person that you want to be, taking a look at that person, noticing what that's like. Inviting that person to be with you. Even if you know, like you're not always going to be that person all the time. Inviting them to be with you. Letting your best self know that you know they're there. Okay. Maybe taking one long breath in and a longer breath out. Yeah. And when you're ready, opening your eyes, maybe typing in any thoughts or reflections that happen to come up into the chat. Any questions too are welcome. I might not answer questions right away, but um, we'll try and get to them in the Q&A se uh, session as well. Awesome. Thank you so much. See, Lisa, you're saying so beautiful. I'm glad that was really beautiful for you. Thank you. For some others, it may have felt challenging or boring, and that's okay too. For some, it might have felt hokey or irrelevant, and that's okay too. So you, you can see that my first slide is like, what is trauma? <laughs> why, why do I start with trauma? Because I'm of the belief that conflict starts with trauma. And an embodied understanding uh, starts, uh, an, an embodied understanding of conflict starts with an embodied understanding of trauma. I do not believe that we can separate these things. Not that every single tra uh, conflict is traumatizing or triggering, but I think it's really easy for conflict to be triggering, maybe more than anything else. <laughs> um, and there's no science on that. This is just me being like, I'm, I'm, I'm really affected by conflict, but maybe you are too. Type into the chat, yes or no, if you feel really triggered by conflict sometimes. Um, and if there's not one person, I will know that at least there's one liar in this group. Um, uh, yes, yes. So lots of people, yes, and perhaps some of you have noticed that you seem to regress in conflict. Maybe you, you get younger in, in kind of when you're in conflict. Maybe some of those really amazing skills that you've learned for dealing with people interpersonally, maybe you're like therapists or child and youth workers, or I don't know, anyone who works like with other human beings in an extended way, you lose some of your skills when you're in conflict. I know, I sure do. So what's that all about? I think it's about trauma. Um, clinically, trauma is defined in the DSM-5, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, as a constellation of psychological symptoms that include flashbacks. So that's going back to traumatic memory, and that's like narrative memory, but it can also just be the felt sense of what the memory was like without the story. Dissociation, so leaving our bodies or leaving the reality that we're in. Um, Hypervigilance, being really, really aware of what conflict um, might be bringing up, like, um, what, what danger conflict might be bringing up. Hypovigilance, so really, really being like kind of not aware or feeling numb or bored, um, irritated um, vaguely by conflict. Sleep disturbance, memory issues, avoidance, aggression. So that's kind of the classic definition of trauma. It's, I don't think it's the best or like most complete definition. It's the one you're gonna get most likely um, if you go see a doctor or a psychotherapist or a psychologist, not to say that these people don't also have alternative definitions. It's just the one that we all learned when we were in therapy school. Um, but trauma is also more than that. You can find some really interesting stuff if you look in, into the literature about how uh, trauma affects us as groups. Kai Erickson, who's a sociologist or Actually, I think Kai Erickson might be passed away now. This was written a while ago. I <laughs> wrote that uh, collective trauma is a group experience of pain, loss, or catastrophe that shatters the social bonds that form a community, which results in loss of trust, dissolution of roles and boundaries, and the breaking of group identity. So essentially, to Kai Erickson, and he has a beautiful quote around this that I wish I had put into this slide, he talks about collective trauma breaking the bonds between individuals so that a collective or a communal body 
in a, in a, in a culture no longer exists in the same way. So that I continue exist to exist though afraid and uncertain, and you continue to exist though distant and dangerous, but we no longer exist as linked cells in a larger communal organism. Thank you, I'm seeing Kai Erickson is alive. That is really great to know. <laughs> um, intergenerationally, um, trauma is uh, defined as pain that is passed from one generation to another through behavioral remodeling, through behavioral mo modeling. So that's when um, parents or other people who are important to us uh, demonstrate by enact, uh, by, um, by acting out uh, trauma. Um, around us, reenactment. So that's when the uh, acting out happens to us and epigenetics. So that's when the stress caused by trauma actually has an impact on the way that our genes express themselves in phenotypes. So in the way that our bodies work. And that research comes from a lot of people, but the primary researcher in there is Rachel Yehuda. Uh, spiritually, we can understand trauma as a shattered expectation so that the way in which we see the world and our place within it is fundamentally altered, leaving us lost and disconnected from a greater sense of meaning. So that's this part of trauma that's like the world doesn't work the way I expected it to. The world doesn't work the way I hoped it would. The world doesn't work at all, right? And if the world doesn't work, if there is no God or you know, higher purpose, or if there is no, um, like, goodness within a human being, then what am I doing here? What am I doing here? And why, why would I want to stick around? Um, and I think this part is really key. I often talk to my conflict coaching clients about uh, uh, conflict as a spiritual initiation. Um, so other kinds of spiritual initiations, and you don't have to believe in spirituality to kind of get the poetic sense of this, are like things like death, um, or uh, big experiences of violence um, or loss, these things that rupture our ability to understand our place within the world. Conflict, I believe, does this too, because very often conflict shows us a side of other people that makes us doubt humanity, like makes us shakes our faith in human beings. And we also see a part of ourselves that shakes our faith in who we are. And these things are really rarely separated. When we, uh, when we look at ourself in a way that, you know, we're like, oh God, I don't want to see that. We're more likely to see that same thing mirrored in another. And when that other person is, sh is sharing <laughs> their wounded part, we're more likely to see our own. And because we don't like seeing our own wounded part, it makes us reject the other person that much harder. Yeah. So that is a little bit about like trauma. Why trauma? <laughs> I'm going to skip the neural learning zone and go right to this window of tolerance model or window of capacity so loved by many trauma therapists. The basic idea, I'm not going to go into the details, is that we have a basic level of nervous system arousal. So the amount of stimulation that any, anyone can take, the amount of stress. Um, and once that we pass that level of optimal stress, um, we go into hyper arousal or this idea that we're overtaxed beyond uh, capacity. We go into our survival modes, fight, flight, freeze. Probably a lot of us have heard of these, but maybe some of us hadn't, that's okay. The fight being like, oh, I'm gonna <laughs> destroy something so I can survive. The flight being, I'm going to run away, get the hell out of here so I can survive. Freeze being, I'm just not gonna move. And then in the not moving, the danger will pass. And that freeze can feel really active and anxious or it can kind of be more low tone and like, oh gosh, I'm just like really disconnected. And if you think about the conflicts you've been in, maybe you can place yourself along this continuum, hey? Like fight or flight, I'm getting out of here. I'm gonna destroy you, <laughs> right? Or freeze, I don't know what to do. Or the low freeze or sometimes called collapse or submit or play dead, depends on who you're talking to, um, of like, oh, I'm just, I'm not here anymore. I'm, I'm like, I'm physically here, but I'm not emotionally here. I can't be here anymore emotionally. I'm just numb. And maybe you've noticed that uh, it's very often that when we're in uh, conflict with people that we really love, one of us will swing one way and the other will swing the other. So one of us is like, I want to like, I want to fight. I want to, I want to get through this. I want to challenge you. I want to shake you and, uh, you know, finish this fight. And the other person's like, I actually really I'm not here. I don't seem to care about it. I, it's not that I don't care, but I can't feel it. And this really tends to make the conflict bigger uh, because we're not able to soothe each other in the way that humans need. Maybe just type into the chat if any of that resonates with you. Like, yes, yes, I feel some of that or no, I've never felt that in my life. All of that is okay. Um, 
So where does loving justice come in? Um, loving justice is this model that I'm developing for like understanding conflict in a way that is spiritually grounded and also really rooted in anti-oppression and trauma informed theory. So I've taken the window of capacity or window of tolerance and adapted it into this window of transformation because I believe that conflict is an invitation to transform. That's not my quote, it's from someone else but I don't know who said it. Uh, so hopefully it's in the public domain. If you know who said it, maybe let me know. Uh, <laughs> conflict is an, in, an opportunity, an invitation to transform, right? So if you think about it, we're having a conflict like, oh, my uncle is so racist. That conflict is you inviting your uncle to transform. And maybe you invite him like, uncle, you should read some articles. Or maybe you're like, oh, God, I just can't talk to you. And that too is in its way an invitation for your uncle to transform. <laughs> um, what we often miss is that the invitation is also for us to transform. So if I'm really upset with my racist uncle, um, there's something in me that is also maybe asking to be changed. Uh, maybe my uncle's actually saying, like, understand where I'm coming from. My, my actual uncles are, you know, in their 60s and they were born in rural China. And maybe they're actually saying, part of them is saying, you need to understand me better. And that's one kind of transformation. But also maybe there's a part of me that needs to say, I'm not going to be able to change my racist uncle necessarily, <laughs> separate person from me. And when he's racist, it makes me think about all the ways that I'm racist because I am racist in a lot of ways. You can't help it you know we're, that's the that's the water we swim in um and i don't like looking at that part of myself so i'm gonna attack my uncle but maybe there's a part of me that is like actually if i changed the way i looked at myself the way that i experienced my uncle would be different not that i would forgive him or condone him but maybe the way i had a relationship with him would be different maybe he would just affect me less i don't know so looking at this window of transformation I believe that there is a certain amount, like a certain level of stress or nervous system arousal and conflict that we can take that then we, uh, that allows us to transform. And unfortunately, we're not really taught, we don't have a ton of experience or practice in most cases to be in our window of transformation. And the penal system, like criminal court, doesn't support this either. We live in a very punitive system that's like, you're gonna go to jail, people in some uh, jurisdictions, not in Canada, but still, we'll get the death penalty. And many, many, many people are killed by the police and other forms of authority um, lawlessly um, or you know in, in racist and genocidal ways. Um, and because of that, you know, we're much more likely to go into survival modes of conflict, like the fight or flight, the destructive mode, the performative mode, this like collapsing, fawning mode that's like, I'm just gonna do whatever, whatever you say to feel better again. I'm gonna do whatever you say so you won't be mad at me. I'll do whatever you say so that I can be good again. And we see a lot of this performative allyship, like, look at me, look at me, look at me, I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. Please don't call me a racist. But that isn't sustainable change because we're not really changing from the place of knowing why I wanna change or having that change come from really within me actually feeling good about myself and the change that I'm making. It's still coming from that place of fear and fear of the other. So I could go much deeper into that, but I know we're running short on time. So I'm actually just going to show you two last slides. First being this, when we, when we are experiencing a conflict, we're often taught to think about, okay, like what's my intent and what's the effect on the other party? Um, what we often miss though, is that the effect on the other party doesn't always, it doesn't always line up in the way we think it will. And this is because um, there are different layers of experience operating on conflict. The first being trauma. So when we do an action, like when I, uh, let's say, don't do the dishes <laughs> and my roommate, I don't have a roommate, but I used to, my roommate notices my not doing the dishes. My intent is like, I'm tired. I'm not going to do the dishes. But my roommate might be like, oh, Kai Cheng is not doing the dishes. She is a lazy, light-skinned, privileged woman. And in many ways, I am a lazy, light-skinned, privileged woman. I embrace my laziness, you know, but not when it hurts others. <laughs> um, and uh, maybe my roommate is like a racialized woman who's really experienced a lot of you know, other people expecting her to clean up after them. And maybe part of her trauma narrative wakes up and goes, that's not okay. This is really not okay. Kai doesn't respect me as a human being. And in some way that's a life threat. Hmm? Um, and 
maybe my my roommate then you know tells me this right <laughs> and I have my own trauma response um and so I cycle into this place of wow my roommate doesn't respect me doesn't notice that I have a chronic disability chronic illness thinks I just have to do everything her way all the time and this is really ableist and she doesn't let him to see me as a human and so I'm under life threat all of a sudden over dishes and you know what lots of big conflict and trauma happens over dishes um and this, so that brings us to the other layer we're not seeing all the time, which is systemic power, privilege, and oppression. Or if we're seeing it, we're not tying it to the trauma layer. We're not able to express it to one another in such a way that it brings us back into our window of transformation. So how do we get into the window of transformation? I'm going to give you this one last slide, and then we're going to jump into, jump into conversation. My suggestion as we practice using these two keys, I call them two keys because I think that they can unlock um, they can unlock our window of transformation so that we can get into it. The two keys are compassion and curiosity. And when we bring those two things together, we often, not always, but often get conflict de-escalation. Not just conflict de-escalation between people, but conflict de-escalation within ourselves. Because you may have noticed this, or maybe not, but I think that every time we're in a conflict with some, someone else, the conflict inside ourselves also opens up. Uh, very, you know, like, so when I'm in a conflict with uh, my boss, imaginary boss, I love my current boss, <laughs> conflict with my imaginary boss, um, who maybe is, you know, accidentally misgendering me, uh, that's really not okay behavior, uh, but also it's opening up conflict inside me of, I'm really upset, and I really want my boss to care about me, and I don't know how to deal with this. Um, other kinds of internal conflicts can open up too, right? So that imaginary boss might be feeling, I just made a mistake, and I really, really just want Kai to get over it, and also I'm such a bad person, and I can't believe how I made this mistake. And depending on which side is more dominant, will kind of um, impact how the conflict shapes out. But when we bring compassion and curiosity into this scenario, it allows us to slow down a little bit and get into a place of trustworthiness and maybe more safety. Compassion has to include compassion for self. So compassion for other, I respect you unconditionally, even if I don't condone your actions and, or beliefs. And self-compassion, I respect myself unconditionally despite my flaws. And my boundaries help me love myself and others. It's really key that we're able to do compassion and self-compassion and curiosity for both at the same time, because this is what allows us to resolve internal tension, which then usually tends to bring down external tension. Um, I'm not saying that this is a perfect model or the model for everybody or every conflict. I'm hoping that it will be helpful to some of you as you move through your own experiences of conflict in the world. I know it's been helpful for me. Um, and I bring it into some of my professional work too, which has had relative success <laughs> uh, for kind of any uh, relative to conflict and success. Um, I know I've gone a little bit over time. Thanks so much for listening. Let's uh, go into some conversation. Yeah, yeah that was so great. Um, thank you so much for that. Um, I think thinking about that, I like one of the things I love about the work, your work is that the way you insist on the humanity of people, even when they cause harm or, um, you know, whether it's intentional or not, and that you hold deeply the knowledge that we can can all do this harm. Um, we can and do cause harm. Um, and so I'm thinking about how to hold this idea in the way we see and support and represent children and youth. So I'm like trying to think about how, how does this matter for children and youth? Um, and do you think there's such thing as this like bad child that, and I think this like figure of the bad child circulates in education and in criminal justice systems and a whole bunch of different kind of social spaces and, and systems. And, and I'm wondering what happens when some children are framed or labels as labeled as bad. Um, and if, you know, what does loving justice look like in terms of um, how we might understand children and youth? Oh my gosh, I love this so much. <laughs> um, so I, I really particularly am like fascinated by the intersection of conflict work and child and youth studies, because, <laughs> <laughs> of that piece about us maybe regressing when, when we are in conflict as adults. Uh, I think what gets triggered inside many of us is I am bad, right? Um, and this is really documented in, in conflict literature. The you know, major worries we have when we're in conflict are, um, am I uh, competent? Am I good? Am I worthy of love? Um, and uh, yeah, I'm, so this, this notion of the bad child, um, in opposition to like a good child, which I think is like 
relatively recent in like human, uh, at least in colonial history's understanding of children, this notion of like the angelic good blank slate child, um, you know, which is a lot of pressure to put on any child to be an angel. <laughs> um, it haunts us um, because it is that flip side or shadow side. And it's very easy to be knocked off the, ped the pedestal of angel, angelic, good child into the bad child space. And many of us are not given any tools or understanding of how to be in the bad child space that isn't immediately either denying <laughs> that we've done anything wrong or like desperately begging, right, for, uh, for to be to be forgiven and brought back into the good child space. So, yeah, I mean, I don't believe that there is such a thing as a bad child. Um, and, you know, having worked with children in like child psychiatry settings for, for a fair amount of time, um, you know, I could see how, how damaging the, the notion of a bad child is, especially to kids who have been sort of forced to take that on in a permanent or almost permanent kind of way. Um, and what we often forget as a society, though, is that those bad children grow up. Um, and it's easier, I think, in many ways to feel sympathetic for a bad child than it is uh, to feel sympathetic to a bad adult. And so we, we really reject and scapegoat this notion of the bad adult, um, which is really just this, you know, what happens when bad children, quote, bad children, aren't given um, like this understanding they aren't really bad, right? That um, maybe their actions are actually just fine, like there's part of being a child. And also maybe if we do things that are bad or harmful, there is a way back. And, you know, it's really, I think it's super important to bring in here like race um, and like racial justice, like thinking about which children get labeled as bad and which get, you know, labeled as in need of counseling help or, you know, psych psychiat psychiatric help, um, which really then ties into this like loving justice, which is a part of the transformative justice movement as I see it, uh, which is abolitionist in nature because we believe that criminalizing and imprisoning bad adults or bad juveniles or children is actually a part of um, like the colonial legacy of um, enslavement and genocide and uh, collective trauma. Yeah, yeah, I yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. And, and I'm like to pull that in then to what's going on in the States right now around like this battle over trans youth rights. I'm like wondering how you're seeing the fight for trans rights relating to transformative justice. So how kind of youth are positioned within this battle for like, um, yeah, for like who, who gets to have rights? Do youth get to have rights? Um, and do you think like the this battle, like uh, is trans rights in, in alignment with transformative justice or are they in tension in some ways? That's a really great question. And I feel like I could write, well, someone <laughs> should write a dissertation. I probably couldn't, but I, like I, want, I want to read a dissertation about that. Um, yeah, and I'm sure many uh, on, on the call may be aware and some may not be right. If I, uh, like there was a, a ruling, I believe yesterday that made, mm -hmm. is it Arkansas? Um, yeah. The first state in America to officially ban, um, you know, gender affirming healthcare for trans young people. This following a, a ruling in, in Britain a few months ago that also officially banned certain forms of gender affirming care, which has now kind of been reversed. It's, it's an ongoing struggle. And the question is, is transformative justice aligned with um, uh, trans rights and particularly ch trans youth rights, um, or are they in tension? And I think it depends on your definition of what um, the rights of the child are. And there's been this struggle, and again, I'm not in child and youth studies, so I bet a lot of people on this call could, could speak to this in a much more uh, you know, eloquent and learned way than me, but my sense is um, if I'm correct, that like there's a, a tension in within um, like an understanding of the child and the young person about like, uh, is a child and young person someone who needs to be protected and kept, you know, pure, like you know, pr pr uh, protected from evil and corruption? Or are they a person who needs freedom and agency to explore the world as they will? And of course, you know, it's probably not so black and white, probably we, we, there's a lot of room for both of those things, um, but people get really stuck in one or the other, probably based on their own experiences of childhood, right? Um, and, and so if we're gonna go into this place of, well, children need to be protected because they're innocent and vulnerable and helpless, which again is a pretty new idea in the history of humans relating to children. Um, it's um, then we kind of then, so I, I think it is intention with trans rights, 
um, depending again, there's lots of definitions of trans rights, but my understanding of trans rights is, it is about this expanding edge of freedom so that, you know, everyone gets to decide who they are in the moment. And there's also sometimes consequences to our choices, but we're free to accept both the joys and the consequences of our, of our, of our decisions. Um, so yes, if we, if we look at it that way, then their intention, but if we look at the rights of a child as someone who deserves to be both protected and also encouraged to explore freedom, right? Because what we need to become adults is in, in an ongoing individuation, at least the sort of the theory I subscribe to, <laughs> then, um, then no, I don't think they are. And this is, I think part of the mistake of the, uh, part of an unfortunate thing about the battle for trans uh, rights when it comes to children and trans uh, medical care, gender affirming medical care around children is that it's been so much about the definition of what is a trans person? What is a real trans person and who deserves care versus what is a child? And how are we understanding children and the responsibility of adults who are lawmakers <laughs> to children? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's like a tricky thing. Oh, there's like a, a couple pieces there that like, yeah, but this is the nature of conflict too, right? Like it's the conflict within ourselves that I think is, is, comes up here. It's not so much like, you know, there's lots of other conflicts, but if you look at all the lawmakers on every side of the debate, there's this like, okay, we're, we're having trouble because we're thinking about ourselves and not so much about what young people actually maybe want or need or are telling us that they want or need. Yeah, yeah. So that like kind of leads into the next question I was thinking of asking you, which is about um, your podcast that you you did um, called Transforming Rounds with Jordan Zaitzow um, about, and you have a specific episode on trans children and youth. Um, and I, I thought it's just did such a good job of highlighting the experiences of trans youth um, and what they want, um, especially in terms of like um, care from others. Um, so I think it was Jordan who said in the, one of the episodes, um, I'm not telling them they can be whoever they want. I'm telling them that I believe them when they tell me who they are. Um, mm. And I really, I re that quote really stuck with me. Um, mm. And it reminds me of your children's book from the stars in the sky to the fish in the sea um, and kind of the message in that children's book. And so I'm wondering if you can say more about how you approach your work with trans youth and what you think affirmative care looks like for trans youth. I love this question. And I love that quote from Jordan too, God, <laughs> so amazing. Um, I'm not telling children they can be whatever they want. I'm telling them, I believe them when they tell me who they are. I love that. Um, I mean, there's a lot of things I could say about my work with trans youth, but I wanna tie it into this conflict piece as well. So the conflict that we often see in working with trans youth and their families, and that is the work that I currently do and I'm still deeply involved in have been for a long time, is the conflict between parents and children parents saying, I want you to slow down. So you're my innocent child and I must protect you. It's my job. And the child saying, I am a free agent growing into myself and I want these things and I need uh, these things in order to be seen for who I am, which will then tell me that you love and affirm me as a human being. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a big conflict. <laughs> it's a really big, important conflict. And um, this thing that Jordan is telling us, I believe you when you tell me who you are, this is that place of the two keys getting compassionate and curious. Like I respect what you're saying to me, even if what you're saying to me changes, because this is the scary part for parents is like often youth and youth will move around and change stuff, right? Like a lot of trans youth will say, I'm, you know, binary trans and they'll say I'm non-binary. And then maybe some will also go back into a binary identity. Maybe they'll try out various non-binary identities. Maybe they'll say they want certain kinds of medical transition. And then they'll say, actually, I didn't really want that at all. It's very frightening for parents um, because they're like, oh my God, what if you regret your decision? Um, which, you know, from, from parents' mindset is often like a pretty valid question. Um, so you know, that's the conflict, but the, the thing about curiosity and compassion is they get us into this place of like, okay, but like, you know, I'm thinking my job is to protect you, but compassion says I should listen to what you're saying right now. And curiosity says, I wonder what you're saying right now. Like, what are you really telling me? Tell me more. And um, the piece about self-compassion that, uh, you know, again, is so often missed, unfortunately, and that I think parents, unfortunately, being in like the unfair squeeze of being a parent, don't get told to be self-compassionate too often um, in a way that isn't like kind of damaging <laughs> is that, you know, it's okay for parents also to be like, wow, I'm having a hard time. Which is that there is a difference between, you know, being like, wow, I'm having a hard time and then spilling the hard time onto the child. Mm 
Yeah. And again, the hard time, the conflict usually wakes up something in the parent. And that conflict usually is, I love my child and I want to stay connected to them and really be with them in the moment. And I'm so terrified for the future and I need to protect them. And then another internal conflict that's like, I was taught that gender is one way. And um, if my child defies that, then I'm going to have to ask a lot of questions about myself. And also this thing that's like, and I love my child and I want to follow my child where they're going. Um, and if we can hold all of those things together with grace, curiosity, and compassion, I think we're usually able to get out on the other side. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm going to move us to the to the kind of Q&A from the audience. Um, and there's a couple of questions in the chat thread. And I just want to encourage other folks to feel free to post in the chat thread if you have any questions. Um, the first question is about restorative justice. So the question is one of the critiques of restorative justice is that it does not challenge the oppressive nature and logics of the medical model. Um, what are your thoughts on this within transformative justice framework? Yeah, mm -hmm. well, I hope I'm understanding the question well, because there are many critiques of restorative excuse me, restorative justice. And I haven't all too often heard that brought together with the medical model. Um, but um, what I can take a guess at is that restorative justice, unlike transformative justice, has had a lot of success, relatively, with being institutionalized. So you'll often see restorative justice in schools, especially here in, quote, Canada, um, and quite often also as a part of like criminal justice, like arms of the criminal justice system. Um, and as a result of that, um, a lot, not all, but a lot of those institutionalized restorative justice programs, and again, they're also non-institutionalized ones, it's a very diverse field, will you reuse the language of victim and offender. Um, or yeah, usually it's victim and offender actually. And also the rehabilitation language and this kind of thing. And that sets up inherently a binary of those who do harm and those who are harmed. And that, um, you know, if we're not being careful, and I think a lot of RJ practitioners are pretty careful, but also some aren't. Um, also doesn't really matter how careful we are sometimes that can reinforce some logics that are um, then kind of bleed into racism again, right? And colonization, because who is getting named as the offender it tends to be more racialized people, it tends to be more black and indigenous people. And who's getting named as the victim, you know, this tends to uphold certain binaries. And it also, even outside of like a racial lens, also holds up this idea of like, okay, some people are broken and they need to be fixed. And some people are like hurt and they need to be healed. And none of that is like necessarily a really empowering model. But what I really will say in defense of the RJ model is that one of its three major principles is engagement. So, you know, um, one of the founders, Howard Zare of the contemporary restorative justice, which is based in ancient indigenous practice, but also really like there's a partnership between primarily Mennonite practitioners and indigenous people here on Turtle Island. So there's a big kind of statement around restorative justice being not about replacing the prison system, but that's not its goal. And that can be really critiqued in a lot of ways. Um, its goal is, however, to create an agency or engagement of the parties who are involved in justice, which is taken away from us, I think, by the contemporary systems of justice. So the people who justice affects, who harm affects, get to be involved. And so that's really important. I think what transformative justice tends to add to this, and again, these are all really diverse fields, right? But a, a generalization I think we can make is that transformative justice is explicitly committed to abolishing the prison system and uh, the criminal justice system as we know it. And so maybe that's some extra um, room there, or some extra inspiration there is to say, you know, we can get rid of this altogether. And somehow still though, we would have to grapple with the question of, so how do we respond and how do we name when there are people who do harm. And also, you know, to harm each other is to be human. <laughs> and um, all of us do harm in some measure at some point in our lives. Yeah, yeah. Um, the next question um, is uh, from Jill. Uh, she says, I had a coworker tell me today, this is why our prison system is so full. Referring to a student who's in grade two, uh, who is often defiant in the classroom. How can we remind adults to be empathetic and thoughtful of maybe deeper level problems in a children in children's lives, often as a result of socioeconomic systemic issues? Oh wow, what a what a statement! Hey, this is why our prison system is so full. Whew. That's big, and especially when applied to a child, that's quite large. Um, so I just want to you know 
sense of empathy uh, in that direction for everyone. Um, but um, yeah, how can we remind adults? Well, I think part of it is like, we can just remind adults, <laughs> like, hey, <laughs> well, you know, that's a, that's a kid. And also prison <laughs> systems, not necessarily a solution to the problem. Um, but if we're gonna be really compassionate and curious, which I say is what I wanna do, right? Um, I think it starts with getting underneath the statement. So what is that person saying? Maybe it's just a thoughtless statement or maybe it has some like pretty ingrained stuff going on. And if you have the energy and we don't all have the energy so you don't always have to engage, but if you want to engage and you feel it's your responsibility to getting under the statement, what does that mean? <laughs> well, could, what do you mean when you say that? And often that interrupts, like often that alone is enough for people to be like, uh, I don't know. <laughs> but but if, if you're really asking in the right way, someone will say, oh, I'm just really tired today and this is blah, blah, blah. And the system does not give us the ability to help people. And maybe it's an answer you like, or maybe it's an answer that's like, oh, well, you know, these people are bad. <laughs> and then that's an opportunity for you to say, well, you know, so then you're making a generalization about groups of people when they're seven or eight years old, if it's grade two, right? They're six or seven years old. So maybe that provokes some more thought as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Um, the next question um, is from Anne. Uh, I've been following your use of charts and graphs with interest on Instagram, and I was glad to see some of them here too. Can you comment on your use of this genre of communication as it stands alongside poetry, story, and narrative? How does it help you communicate your key words like compassion and curiosity? I ask in part because I'm ambivalent about clinical categories like trauma, although I have some, I've used some of them in my own work, uh, but always interested in alternative vocabularies to medical ones. Yeah, oh, such a great question. I see like there's a couple questions in here. Um, and again, I'm hoping I'm understanding correctly. So I have recently become like deeply involved in the making of infographics. <laughs> Um, I didn't, I didn't think that I was going to become like an infographic artist, um, <laughs> but here we are. Um, and I love them because I think the infographic has a lot of potential to be poetic in ways we don't expect, like the economy of, um, of like space and image and words together produces a lot of meaning, uh, which is what poetry is essentially, right? Well, poetry is like when you produce a lot of meaning with relatively few words, um, so I don't know, I think that's kind of sort of how I get into it. Um, and I also will say, when you present something as an infographic, it hits a different part of the brain for a lot of people, <laughs> or like it's a different part of culture in like a lot of communal or collective bodies. Um, Cause you're like, they're like, oh, it's an Instagram, how it's an infographic, how official, right? And that's slightly different. And also the organization of information um, in a visual way is often really helpful for people who are not necessarily inclined to read a long um, sort of dialectic piece of writing and be like, okay, we're gonna, these are all the exact points and all the dates and references. Um, so it's faster than that. And it's also clearer than someone reading say a piece of poetry or fiction and being like, okay, so here's all these emotional things, symbols and allegories, and here's what I'm gonna make out of that. The infographic is a way to get right to the heart of meaning in a way that's very accessible um, to a lot of people and not accessible to all, but it's just one more tool. Um, the trauma piece, I like this question. Yeah, trauma is a huge buzzword right now <laughs> uh, in, in certain parts of, uh, you know, queer community and the social justice community, certainly in the mental health and uh, human services field. I think for good reason, trauma has gone really ignored um, uh, for, for a lot of colonial history. Um, and, uh, you know, it has a, kind of an expanding definition. Um, so expanded that I, I would say it sort of transcended the clinical category now because people talk about trauma all the, all the time in ways that are not clinical. But I think it's good to cultivate um, vocabularies that, um, that resonate with the people that we're working with, whether or not they're medical. Um, and so this is, you know, I, I think, you know, we could, we could use the word trauma, we could use the language of the nervous system, but we can also just talk about human woundedness, right? And what is a natural response to being wounded is to be defensive. And defensiveness can be like aggression defense, or it can be, you know, submission defense. Um, and these are words also that I think make a lot of sense to people that don't go into like diagnostic categories. Yeah. 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 Um, I, I think we're at our end here. It's uh, it's seven o'clock and um, I don't see any more questions in the chat thread. So 
Um, I want to thank you so much, Kai Chang, um, for talking to us about transformative justice, for um, having a conversation with me. Um, I really appreciate your time. Um, and again, I want to thank the departments that help put this event on. Um, that's the, the Pauli Jewett Women and Gender Studies Program, the Department of Law and Legal Studies, the Department of Sociology and Anthropology, and uh, the Childhood and Youth Studies Program at Carleton University. Um, thanks so much for everyone who came. Um, I hope you have a really great evening. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Julia. This has been wonderful.